All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily. Can you guys see me at all? I can. OK. Um, so welcome to Virtual Pollinator Week. I am one of the educators at the St. Louis Zoo, and I'm going to help Ed out today by doing some of the behind the scenes work here. And um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we're going to try to have time at the end for questions, but the way that we will be able to answer your questions is if you put them in the column at the bottom of your screen that says Q and A. Um, there is another spot. It says chat on it. That is for you guys to just chat with each other about things. Maybe say how much you love native bees and um, all of that, but we won't be monitoring, monitoring that specifically for questions. So put those over in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end of Ed's presentation. So um, without too much further fanfare, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Ed Spivak. He is the Curator of Invertebrates at the St. Louis Zoo and the Director of the St. Louis Zoo Wild Care Institute for Native Pollinator Conservation. So we're in for a treat today to learn a lot from him. So I will let him take over. Okay, let me get this thing started. Okay, first off, can you see all that? Can you see the image? Yes, we can see you. Excellent. Well, thank you for the second webinar for National Pollinator Week. Hopefully some of you also attended Tuesdays on how to identify the bees. We will be doing a little bit of bee identification today too, but mostly what I wanted to talk about is how do you create habitats for bees? And by doing so, you also help other wildlife too. So without further ado, as Emily mentioned, I'm Ed Spivak, and I've been doing this now, ooh, well, yeah, here at the St. Louis Zoo for 12 and a half years. I spent a lot of time looking at bees. I've been out all day today uh, looking at bees, particularly one specific bee, which has been showing up in our garden, trying to get pictures of it. So I'm really focused on pollinators, and I'm hoping that you'll be focused on pollinators too. For those of you who may have attended Tuesdays, you'll see a few of these intro slides very similar because I really want to emphasize that pollinators are incredibly important. They're also incredibly diverse too. There are wasps, there are beetles, there are moths, there are butterflies, flies, birds, bats, bees of course, as well as in other parts of the world, black and white rough lemurs in Madagascar, there are some slugs, there are some amphipods, there are a whole variety of species. But pollinators are important because 90% of flowering plants, around 400,000 species, depend to some extent on animal pollination, moving the pollen from the male parts of the flower to the female parts of the flower. Bees are the most important group as uh, of pollinators for a couple particular reasons. One, they provide for their young by collecting pollen. Many plants have evolved ways of attaching pollen to an animal or because they have hair or feathers that just kind of collects on them and they move them from flower to flower. But bees are actively collecting pollen because that's what they're feeding their kids. They also show what's called flower constancy, which means that if a bee is going to say a goldenrod flower, it will tend to go to a goldenrod flower to a goldenrod. It's an aster, 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 aster. This ensures pollination. And for many bee species, they are specialists. We'll talk about that in a moment too. But they really need you know, that pollen and that specific type of pollen many times. Why we care about pollination, 75% of our crop species worldwide require pollinators, most of those being bees. In the US, over $29 billion of our crops are dependent on honeybees. I say over 29 billion because if you look at, for example, the value of tomatoes, there is a value for tomatoes, which is incorporated in this amount. But if you now look at every pizza place, every hamburger place serving tomatoes or ketchup or marinara sauce, every Italian restaurant, that greatly expands the value of tomatoes beyond the original value of tomatoes. Worldwide, at least 577 billion, at least one out of every three mouthfuls of food that we drink or eat. Why one third of our diet, but three quarters of our food? 
It's because most of our diet is wind pollinated, such as corn, rice, wheat, barley, oats. You can live on it, can't really survive well, but if you really wanna care about your health, flavor, color, really care about the pollinators and really the bees. And it's also not just about us. And I'm gonna talk again why it's not just about us, but it's all those other species which feed on the products of pollination, whether it's fruits eaten by bears or the wild strawberries eaten by box turtles in Forest Park <clears throat> or the berries. Like for example, this year, our robins ate all of our service berries. Uh, we got very few, but they love them. They're feeding on our raspberries. They're feeding those to their kids too. And I wanna emphasize that when we talk about bees and pollinators in general, it's really about diversity. This is a simple example. If we're pollinating apple trees, honeybees can pollinate apple trees. You can put a few hives in there, but honeybees really work the flower just one way so that you will get apple production, you will get um, you know, flavorful crop, but if you now include a lot of different types of bees, and look at these different types of bees, from mining bees to two-spotted bumblebees to mason bees and small carpenters. Each of them are different sizes. They're gonna work the flower a little bit differently. So it actually increases pollination. So you actually get larger fruit, larger seed set, you know, and more valuable and healthier crops. So it's really about bee diversity, not bee abundance. And that's when we're gonna be talking about creating gardens, because we really want to encourage bee diversity. Because when most people think about bees, this is what they think of the European honeybee. This is not a native species. It was first introduced in the U.S. around 1621. Uh, they're now found all over the world. What I say about honeybees is honeybees get all the press, but many of our native bees are actually disappearing. Honeybees are not endangered. Commercial beekeepers may be. We need to start thinking about the other species. And there are over 20,000 species worldwide of bees, 4,000 in North America. Here in Missouri alone, we have over 470 species. And a paper we just published a couple of years ago, just for the St. Louis area, which we define as from the river to within the I-270 belt, we've identified over 201 species of bees just in that area. And that's over 45% of the bee species for Missouri alone. They're incredibly diverse, very different in sizes. This is a picture of one of the smallest bees in North America, actually the smallest bee, Perdita minima. It's only two millimeters long. The face you may recognize if you've got a wooden deck, soffit, porch, carport. This is the face of a large carpenter bee female. It's one of the largest of our bees, not necessarily the largest, but it gives you an idea of size range for bees. So there's a lot of bee diversity out there. So just going uh, from top left down to bottom right, we've got mask bee, small carpenter bee, fluorescent green metallic sweat bee, Sunflower longhorn bee, spring polyester bee, Andrina carlini, unfortunately no common name, uh, Megacali nimica, no common name, one of the leaf cutter bees, small resin bee, black and yellow bumblebee. But many of our bees are in trouble and pollinators in general for a variety of reasons. And this is some of the same reasons where a lot of species are having problems. Loss of habitat and fragmentation, invasive plant species that outcompete our native plants or our native uh, animals can't use them, changes in agricultural practices, misuse of pesticides, diseases and parasites, pollution, competition with introduced species, a whole litany of things which if we wanted to, we could just give up right now and be pessimistic and just go have a drink. But the beauty about pollinators and the beauty about pollinator conservation is we can all be pollinator conservationists and we can do that right at home. And what I'm gonna do is go through 10 different tips that would help you to welcome native bees. And many of these tips are also going to help us attract butterflies, birds, and a variety of the species. I'm gonna go through each of these one by one with examples and really give you an idea of what you need to do. So these 10 tips, plant native plants, avoid cultivars, plant for succession. I don't really wanna read this slide because I'm gonna go through each one in particular. But if you follow these 10 tips, you're going to really, I think, have a really good pollinator garden and also hopefully influence your neighbors to get them to do things too. So first off, plant native plants. So why native plants versus exotics? Well, first off, they enhance our native biodiversity. They do provide pollen nectar resource for pollinators. And I'm gonna mention this in a little bit that many of our bees in particular only can feed on our native pollens and nectar. 
They're recreating native habitats. They're also adapted to local climates. So when we have drought, when we have a lot of rain, our native plants are really adapted for that. And many of the exotics are not. We have a number of great resources here in St. Louis and actually Missouri in general. Grow Native, which is Missouri wide, actually now uh, into surrounding states, is an excellent resource to find nurseries that sell native plants, uh, installers, etc. It's through the Missouri Prairie Foundation. We help them in developing these plant tags, which you can find on some plants, Pollinator Buffet. There's also the Monarch Cafe. Some of the plants that we recommend, they also include pictures that I've taken of uh, some bees. Um, to really give you an idea, these are plants which are recommended to support our native bees. We also have a number of good plant suppliers too, like Missouri Wildflowers, uh, Hamilton Native um, Outpost. A lot of these good suppliers, we're very lucky here in Missouri. Another reason I really want to stress some of our native plants, and because they're so adapted, they have deep roots. And why deep roots are important? For a couple of reasons. One is that they're better for stabilizing the soil. They help to sequester carbon in the soil. They also help to allow for water to get into the soil. They open it up, which helps to reduce flooding. In this example, all the way here on the left is Kentucky bluegrass. You can see not much in the way of roots. When we start looking at things like lead plant, you know, Indian grass, um, big blue stem, uh, purple, pale purple coneflower, all of these have deep roots, which really help and stabilize. And it also makes them really drought tolerant and you know, rain tolerant. These are uh, adaptations which allow them to survive our changing conditions. Point two, avoid cultivars and double blossoms. Now, a lot of times when you go to a nursery, you may see a variety of different types of plants and it may say rose. We have a number of native roses. And I show an example here of one of our pure native roses. And this is with a small mask bee. You can see how open it is. The bee is able to access nectar and pollen. Uh, this variety um, of a type of tea rose, I couldn't tell you the actual variety, but you can see there's far more petals. When we do these double blossoms with these cultivars, what we're actually doing is converting these anthers where the pollen, the food is, converting them into petals. As we get more and more petals, and you've seen, many of you probably seen roses where you can't even see the anthers and there's no way for the bee to get to the nectar. So you can see there's much less space in this area for that bee to get to than with our natives. So avoid double blossoms and also cultivars can be problematic too. So this is an example from the Xerxes Society looking at purple coneflower. So this is our native variety of purple coneflower. There are a lot of cultivars in native coneflower. This one here, this one is called Green Jewel. Um, personally, uh, I don't even find this attractive. But when you start doing this to a plant, you also uh, reduce the, the nectar guides, the attractants. So bees aren't seeing this pale green, so they're not actually going to be attracted to it. Here's one called the pink double delight. Here's an example of that sort of double blossom. There's no way a bee can get in here. It's also sterile. There are those some cultivars, this one in particular called Magnus. It just produces more blossoms and is very similar to the wild type. So really look at these cultivars. If you can try to get the pure natives, there's still research being done as to you know, what the effect is of these native Rs and cultivars. Are they good? Are they bad? but some we can tell right away that these are going to be problematic. For example, like these two. Number three, plant for a succession of blooms. Bees are active throughout the year, spring, summer, and fall. We often tend to think about summer, particularly in a normal year when we might be at home and summer vacation. That's when we kind of enjoy our gardens more, but bees are active spring and fall. We really need to think about those plants throughout the year. So you really also want to have at least three blooming species because you really want that diversity. It's a diversity of diets. And also remember, it's all about bee diversity too. One of the reasons you want that seasonality, this is an example, this is also from Mike Arduzer, formerly of Missouri Department of Conservation. Um, when you look at many of our native bees, many of them are active throughout the year. So April and October, you have Hylaeus, which is our mass bee. Agachlorella, Agachlorella, Halectus, Agapasmolasi, Glossum. Those are all types of sweat bees. 
Serotina, small carpenter bee, Bombus, bumblebee. You can find them April through October, so you really need to think about that entire year of bloom. Some species, for example, Osmia, mason bees, are only active April and May. So if you don't have anything blooming in April and May, you're not going to have these mason bees. Similarly, August, September is when you tend to see most of the Melosodes, the longhorn bees. If you don't have anything blooming then, you're not going to be able to support those bees. So when you start figuring out what you want to plant, start thinking about the season. I put this together and I've got uh, my email at the end uh, if you're interested in getting a, a spreadsheet of this. I just started looking at some of our native plants when they bloom to get an idea and also if they're trees, shrubs, um, a few non-invasive uh, exotics, but really want to understand when they're blooming so I make sure that we have things blooming throughout the entire year. The one example I really like to give to show the importance of seasonality of bumblebees. Bumblebees, unlike honeybees, have an annual cycle. Honeybees, the queens live from year to year, and so the colony goes on from year to year to year. Bumblebees, their colony only lives for a year. The queen only lives for a year. So in the spring, new queens, which have been hibernating in the fall, emerge. They start feeding on nectar plants, and most of those are gonna be things like trees and shrubs. If there are no spring blooming plants, the bumblebees cannot start their colonies. So you will not have any more bees, bumblebees for the rest of the season. Once they start their colony, of course, you need those summer blooms to feed the workers and the rest of the colony. And then fall is an incredibly important time because new queens are produced for the next year. They are bred. And then what they do, they start feeding up and storing energy. Think of when people talk about grizzlies or bears feeding on berries and fish and all these other things to put on body fat. Bumblebee queens are doing the same thing. They're feeding on asters and blazing stars and goldenrods. So if you don't have those, these bees can't store up enough energy to overwinter to start the col another colony next year. So it's really emphasizing that entire year cycle for flowers. And as I mentioned, spring is a tough time. So don't forget trees and shrubs. Trees and shrubs are oftentimes the mainstay for spring. These are some examples which I like, but there are many others. Uh, red maple, our native red maple is a really good pollen nectar plant. Oftentimes they're blooming around Easter. One year, a uh, few years ago at Easter time when traffic was minimal, so it was really kind of quiet, I walked out into our garden and I just heard this buzzing all around the tree. And I'd walk away and it diminished. I'd walk towards the tree and it buzzed some more and walk away. And I saw at least six different species of bees in there. I called my wife out of the house just so that she can come and hear this because it's, it's such a cool experience to hear the bees. Other things, willows are one of the earliest blooming. We actually have some specialist bees just on willows. Redbud is a great one. Large carpenter bees use it, but one of the bees we have around here, the southeastern blueberry bee, besides feeding on blueberries, the alternate food for it is redbuds. Crab apples and many of our native fruit trees support a lot of different types of bees. This is a blue orchard mason bee. I've seen, oh, spring polyester bees. I've seen cuckoo bees, small carpenter bees, mining bees, bumblebees, all on crab apples. Incredibly important. Black chokeberry, um, also one of our native plants, a really good one that supports a lot of our mining bees. So look at your land and figure out where you can put some of these trees and shrubs in order to support these bees. But here's where it gets even more interesting. It's not necessarily just about the bees when we're creating diversity in our gardens. 90% of all insects that eat plants require native plants to complete their development. So when we're planting exotic trees and shrubs, these insects can't eat them. Now we tend to look at that as, oh, this is great. We don't have an insect pest. But this is an excellent book, Bringing Nature Home, if you're not aware of it, by Doug Tallamy from University of Delaware. The reason we want these insects to feed on these plants is because of the caterpillar connection. 96% of our North American land birds feed their young with insects, and much of that is caterpillars. So when we think of things like cardinals, we put out a bird feeder for cardinals, and the adults are happy feeding on seed, but they feed their kids caterpillars. So if you don't have caterpillars, you're not going to have those uh, baby birds uh, being able to survive. As an example, here are a single pair of breeding chickadees, much cat 7,500 caterpillars, drear one clutch of young. 
So that's a four chicks in a 14 day period collecting 7,500 caterpillars. And that's just to get them out of the nest. Now you need another 7,500 just to get them out of the home. So we need those native trees and shrubs and other herbaceous plants to produce those caterpillars to allow the birds to feed their young. So without these native plants, which are also pollinated by our bees, we don't have the caterpillars of other pollinators, bird, uh, moths and butterflies, and then we don't have the songbirds. Everything is interconnected. So this is a listing from Bringing Nature Home, just to give you an idea. So oak um, support 534 moth and butterfly species, black cherry 456, willow 455, crab apple 311, elms 213, chestnut, all of these are really good. So if you can get these plants on, in your area, in your yard, um, or in your land, these are incredibly important. If you can't necessarily get the trees, look at some of these herbaceous things. Goldenrod, 115 species, butterfly and moth species supported. Asters, 112. Sunflower, 73. You really want to do this. If, you, if we were to throw up a thing, things like a ginkgo or Bradford pear, basically you'd see zero. They support no caterpillars, so therefore they support no birds. So we really need to make sure that we have everything connected from the pollinators to the plants to the birds. You want to, five, plant a diversity of plants with different flower shapes, sizes, and colors. So I show this example. Here you can see uh, six different types of plants, six different types of bees, all of them different sizes. This black and yellow bumblebee on Baptisia australis blue false indigo, this Andrina carlini on crab apple, this small carpenter bee on Erigeron fleabane, and this is only about the size of a dime across here, so this is a very small bee. This leaf cutter bee on sneezeweed, and even though it's called sneezeweed, it does not cause hay fever. This small resin bee on bee balm. Bee balm is a great plant. Bumblebees love it, but a lot of these small bees love it too. And here's a spring polyester bee on red bud. So these different bees are gonna be attracted to different flowers and shapes. One of the reasons for that is tongue length. So this is a small carpenter bee on elderberry. So elderberry, if you have them in your backyard and know some, it's a very small blossom. This is a very small bee. So therefore it has a very short tongue. So you need some very shallow nectaries in order to feed these bees. An exception, you know, in reverse or not the, so the, the, the opposite of this would be something like this. This is Anthophora abrupta, one of our digger bees. Now this has an incredibly long tongue. Now you think it's a long tongue uh, in relative proportion to the bee, but that's not its full tongue. When it's completely extended, it is longer than its body. So long tubular flowers are incredibly important. I tend to see this be on plants like Pensamon digitalis, foxglove beard tongue, which has a long tube. So it's very important for having these long tubular flowers for bees like this. Bees like this could not use something like that fleabane or the elderberry because the, uh, the flower is too shallow. And when we talk about diversity, sometimes it's diversity within a species itself. So this is an idea showing bumblebees. This is within a colony of the eastern bumblebee. This is a queen. These are workers. Um, and some of the workers can be even smaller than this. So different size flowers that can cater to both the queens and the early workers and later workers. So you really want to maximize pollinator diversity in your garden. If you've got 15 to 25 flowering species, you're really maximizing diversity. If you can get more than that, even better. But we're to kind of use that as a ballpark. So if we're talking about at least three per uh, season, think about it really kind of five fl uh, flowering plants per season, spring, summer, and fall to get to that 15 species. But as always, the more the merrier. Additionally, we have a number of bees which are specialists that they can only feed on certain types of plants. So if you don't have those plants, you're not going to have them. Also work by Mark Arduzer. Oligolectic is the big word for the day. So within bees, we refer to them as either being polylectic, oligolectic, or even monolectic. Polylectic means that they feed on many different types of, flower, of pollen and nectar. Honeybees are an example of this. Bumblebees are an example of this. They'll go to many types of flowers. Oligolectic, they feed on very few. And this could be 
a family um, or even a genus and various species. If we say monolectic, it may just be one species that it feeds on. So here an example, this is the asters, sunflowers and their relatives. We have, you know, around 60 different species which specialize on them. Fabaceae, which are legumes, are beans. Willows, Silaceae, other families. So you can see if you do not have those species, you're not gonna have those bees. And here's an example showing a few of our different specialist bees we have around here. Southeastern blueberry bee, 90 to 95% of its diet is blueberry. The other is really red bud. Sweet potato vine bee, Melatomatoria, feeds on sweet potato vine, morning glories. Hibiscus bee on hibiscus, it will often use the exotic rose of Sharon, but it far prefers our native hibiscus and hardy hibiscus. Squash bee, that's pretty much it. Squash bees feed on and collect pollen from our squashes. So if you're growing squashes, that's what they're, you'll probably find these bees in there. And then sunflower bee feeding on sunflowers and their relatives. Also as an example of specialization, when we plant in the garden, the one specialist that we often tend to think about are monarchs. So we, I'm just telling you about the birds, but these milkweeds are incredibly important too. Milkweed is the only thing that monarch caterpillars can feed on. So you need to have things like butterfly weed or butterfly milkweed, common milkweed, swamp marsh or red milkweed. These are what's gonna support our monarchs, but they're also incredibly good nectar sources. I was out in our garden today. We've got a lot of common milkweed in bloom. There are bumblebees all over, mast bees all over it. There's some honeybees on it. And then we had a female monarch show up today and she's laying eggs on milkweed all over the garden. And as I said, the bees love them too. So here you can see a leaf cutter bee on butterfly weed, milkweed. One of our bumblebees is a brown belted bumblebee on common milkweed. And this is one of our small mask bees. Mask bees really, these little tiny bees really seem to like milkweed. Milkweed is a really good nectar source. It is not a good pollen source for bees. It is really all about the nectar. Six, create floral targets or repeat plantings. So what I mean by that, think of flowers as billboards or signposts. So if you're going down to Lake of the Ozarks, you know, for a while you don't really see much and then suddenly there's billboard after billboard after billboard to tell you, hey, you're gonna be Lake of the Ozarks. There's a lot of stuff happening here. Think of flowers in the same way. If you've got one flower, a bee may not see it. If you've got a lot of them, then you're actually making a statement. You're saying, come on here, this is where you want to dine. So you really wanna do clumps of flowers. If you can, one general rule of thumb is uh, one you know, yard, one square yard of flowers. This is often very difficult in a lot of yards. Um, so what you can do is do repeat plantings repeat species throughout the garden and in various areas. So then it also encourages more or less normal foraging behavior for the bee to go from flower to flower. And also many species of bees feed on only a single plant species during a foraging trip. So if you don't have enough of that flower, it may be very difficult. And as I mentioned before, spe specific pollen and nectar for specific bees if you want to have them in the garden. Now we often think about okay, let's feed them, but they also need some place to nest too. So seven, provide nesting sites for bees. Now for honeybees, we often tend to think about, oh, they live in a hive, it's a box. We like honeybees because they're in a box and move them from place to place. Our native bees don't live in boxes like that, though you can kind of create some habitats. Bumblebees are probably the most difficult. Um, you can find online bumblebee uh, the success rate is very low, ranging from like zero to maybe a max of 17%. People are trying to experiment to attract them. But for bumblebees, really the most important thing right now is planting those flowers. But two other groups of bees we can really kind of help. These are the ground nesting bees. This is also the spring polyester bee. And twig and tunnel nesting bees, such as this alfalfa leaf cutter bee. So these are solitary bees, but oftentimes many of them don't mind living next to each other. For our ground nesting bees, about 70% of our bees are ground nesting bees like this one, which is very common in our area, the Varesin green metallic sweat bee. Oftentimes you look in the garden and this is how we found them in our garden. We saw these holes with these kind of like little turrets above them. And we often then found a little face looking out. 
So here, a female is protecting the nest from ants or other bees which may want to get in or parasitoid flies. So they always have a guard at the entrance. So when you're looking around from above, the bees, you know, they may resemble, you know, ant nests, but look around if you don't see ants going in and out, odds are it's probably a bee. They often prefer bare ground, but you can find them mixed in with some grasses. That's where I found some of our little sweat bees and also some, uh, actually the first uh, rice and green metallic sweat bee in our yard was actually in um, the grasses. And this is also one concern that people may have too. Well, these ground nesting bees, aren't you concerned about you know, getting stung? Not ground nesting bees. Now our yellow jackets, and also particularly the European yellow jackets, they nest in the ground. They are a social wasp, they are not a bee. Give an example, if you run your lawnmower over a yellow jacket nest, you are going to get stung. If you run your lawnmower over ground nesting bees, they're annoyed by you, but now they're just spending their time trying to find the holes that you just covered up. And actually this is how I discovered the first bee yard where we used to live in Dogtown here in St. Louis. I was mowing the lawn and then suddenly I saw this pile of dirt after I mowed over this one area. And then I saw this one lone bee kind of circling around looking for the hole I just buried. There were no ants. It was the fluorescent green metallic sweat bee. And I later looked around and I found more nests for them. But they weren't, you know, aggressive at all. This is a single female usually making these nests like here for the spring polyester bee. Fluorescent green metallic bees is actually several different females, but inside that burrow, they have their own chambers where they're raising their young. So as an example, this is um, a, a nesting area out in Lake St. Louis from a few years ago. This was next to a driveway. When you first look at it, you really don't see anything. You look a little closer and you find there's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole, there's one up here, there's one over there. And this was an area probably about 30 by 30 feet and it was just covered with holes. And so I'm crawling around, looking around, trying to get pictures of these bees, finding them crawling out of their nests and absolutely no issues whatsoever. They are not aggressive. I like to say that this is a, an incredible spectacle. It's like the migration of the Serengeti, the migration of the wildebeest in the Serengeti. They move onto the grassy plains at one part of the year and then they're gone. These bees, like these spring polyester bees, they're there for one part of the year and then they're gone. So really enjoy them. You can enjoy them with your family, friends, neighbors, kids, grandkids, and really not worry about them, really enjoy them. Some of the ground nesting bees that we have in this area, fluorescent green metallic sweat bee, squash bee, and many times the squash bees like to nest underneath the squashes. So if you are growing squashes, don't put down a weed barrier um, because they will tend to prefer nesting underneath there. Hibiscus bee, mining bees, the andrenids, and the sunflower bee. You can try to create a nesting site for these ground nest bees. This is an experiment I did this year. I'm calling a bee bed. I just dug out a and I was trying to look at, you know, if anyone else had done this and their general information online. I found one uh, researcher that said dig a 20 inch deep hole, um, one, uh, three feet by three feet. If you've ever tried to dig 20 inches in our St. Louis clay soil, yeah, I stopped after 10 inches. I was, I was tired. Um, but it is three feet by three feet. And actually in that first, in this spring, I had uh, at least one mining bee, one andrenid, at least three lazy blossoms nesting in it. But I even expanded it more. I included these stems here too. So these stems are uh, segments of raspberry and hydrangea stems. And if you look very closely, and I'll get close up in a second, these little holes, some of our bees like the uh, small carpenter bee, but many beneficial wasps will nest in these vertical nests. So like this spring or this uh, small carpenter bee, here she is nesting in one of those stems in my bee yard, my bee uh, this year. So she was just coming out, but they dig out these pithy stem plants. So pithy stem plants, if you've cut them, you can set them up and arrange them, whether it be in a pot or in the ground. If you are cleaning up your uh, backyard, Cut your plants only about 18 to 24 inches long because those will be used. So things like uh, goldenrod or cup plants, those sorts of things, bees will utilize those for their nesting sites. So don't remove them completely. 
twig and tunnel nesting bees, these are sometimes a little bit easier. So those twig and tunnel, the small carpenter bee is a type of twig and tunnel nesting bee where you can create those vertical nests. But many of these others, you can also create other types of nests. So about 30% of our uh, native bees are twig and tunnel nesters. Historically, they would use beetle uh, burrows or woodpecker holes, uh, but you can create artificial nests for them. This is the first one I ever did. It's a four by four block of wood. So technically it's three and a half by three and a half because we, we would cut wood and I drilled holes three and a quarter inches deep. And I drilled them for different sizes for different types of bees. And in that first year we had, besides a couple uh, potter wasps, we also had alfalfa leaf cutter bees using them. And these bees, I would get within an inch of them looking at them either with my naked eye or with a camera and they could care less. So place them where you want to watch them going in and out and seeing what they're doing. You can also use stems. So this is bamboo. Uh, this is Phragmites, an invasive reed, and you can see the bees have used different leaves and flower petals to seal these up. This is Megacala mendica, one of our larger leaf cutter bees. This is Megacala rotundata, alfalfa leaf cutter bee, looking viciously at me, but they are harmless. These are wonderful to watch and see them going in and out, carrying their pollen and carrying in these leaf fragments. Additionally, as I mentioned, these cut stems, if you also have shrubs, so this is hydrangea. So when we cut those hydrangea, trim them back, you'll see this white pithy stem. If you see it looking like a little compost uh, heap, either a bee or a beneficial wasp is using that and nesting in. In this particular case, I opened it up and found three cocoons of actually a type of wasp called a cabronid, which specializes on flies. It actually helps to get rid of the flies in your yard. But here's from an elderberry stem, and I watched this leaf cutter bee for two days filling up this stem with segments of leaves to create her nest. So look at some of these things. When you cut roses, you'll notice there's usually a hole in that. And small carpenter bees and other small bees will utilize those. So these cut stems are also really important traditional native nest sites for these bees. Some of the bees which are going to use them, like Megachile anemica and Megachile mendica, um, the small uh, osmia, small, car small mason bees like this one, osmia georgica. You may already have these in your yard, but you may not notice the bees. If you look at your plants and you see these beautiful oval or circular holes cut out of leaves or your flower petals, you've got leaf cutter bees. So put up a bee hotel, a bee condo, bee apartment, whatever you like to call it, because you have the bees, they're just looking for nesting sites too. Also, if you've ever done any construction around your house, if you've left a hole, odds are some bee is probably using that for nesting in. This is actually at the Insectarium at the St. Louis Zoo. This is within a concrete wall. When it was poured, they had some forms put up and they left these holes. I looked in one day and there was a leaf cutter bee looking out at me. Or sometimes you may just see the dried leaf that they use to seal up their nest. One of our really small bees, which utilize some of these things are the small mask bee. To give you an idea of size, this is in one of our bee blocks. This is only an eighth of an inch in diameter. And the mass bees, Hylaeus, are actually one of our polyester or cellophane bees. So you can see they actually line their nest with this plastic-like material that they secrete, which is waterproof and antifungal and antibacterial. But you can be creative about these bee hotels. We had some of our students do this for a project um, up in Florissant, the um, Florissant Community Garden and Pollinator Park near the St. Ferdinand Shrine. And our students built this uh, upcycled pieces of wood with a um, bicycle wheel and a hubcap and um, hangers. So it looked like flowers. And we drilled holes through all of these. And that first year we had five different species of bees nesting like this Carter bee and this small resin bee. Now other species that will build their own nests are the large carpent bees, which we're familiar with There's a female they will drill their holes themselves. Um, oftentimes people can, are concerned. I don't worry about them very much. You, you would need an awful lot of these bees to really kind of take down a structure. So for example, at the Insectarium at the St. Louis Zoo, we have these wooden arbors above the entrance and exit. The building is now 20 years old. These bees have been nesting there for 20 years and they are still as strong as ever. So kind of share the wood with them. They don't really care for painted wood. So if you can paint it, uh, staining and bare doesn't bother them.
but also just put up some other pieces of wood that they might use instead if you want to move them somewhere else. But also leave that dead vegetation in your yard. So this is a dead stem, as I mentioned before. Uh, this was from, um, wasn't a cup plant. I'm trying to remember what plant this was, but actually we had a mason bee nesting in there. But many of our native bees, particularly our male, like in this particular case, the uh, two-spotted longhorn bee males, they like to sleep on dead vegetation. So if you have a garden, if there's some dead vegetation, they seem to really prefer that, this particular species, they will come back each night to sleep. So don't be real neat. Make sure you have a little bit of dead vegetation in order for them to sleep. And also if you got some rotting wood, which is really good too. So Augachlora pura, one of our green metallic sweat bees, they actually nest in rotting wood. So if you leave a little bit of rotting wood, you can also support these bees too. Number eight, eliminate pesticides. Now I know that always sometimes there may be a need for pesticides, but we often tend to kind of go a little bit overboard. When we look at pesticides in general, which are herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, if we go to a store to buy them, oftentimes the concentration used are incredibly high in these uh, insecticides. We often worry about agriculture using so many pesticides, but on a per acre basis, we use far more pesticides on our lawns and gardens than any farmer ever uses. As I said, when you go to someplace like Home, uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, those concentrations may be 30 times higher than anything a farmer may use. Additionally, if some people, when they see an aphid, they think that's a problem and want to spray, but those aphids are also supporting those beneficial insects, which then are also controlling other insect pests too. So think about them. They're also not selective too. So if you're using them, they're killing everything. They're not just you know, harming any ugly bugs. They can also be affecting butterflies, bees, ladybirds, etc. Number nine, reduce or eliminate lawns. This is a big one that you know, we're trying to push a lot. Lawns are uh, really kind of problematic. Turf grass, which includes lawns, and other, is the largest irrigated crop in the US and covers an area of almost 50 million acres combined, which is larger than the state of Missouri. So how many places you've been to or homes you've seen where they have these beautiful manicured lawns? It is a biological wasteland. Nothing can survive. So we've started removing, this is our house in Lindenwood Park, where we've started removing sections of our lawn to incorporate wildflowers of, of various types, some grasses, trees like redbud. We've planted American plum, Mexican plum, service berry, uh, uh, chokeberry, a variety of things. But trying to get rid of the lawn is really important. But if you have to have a lawn, try to create a bee, a flowering bee friendly lawn. And work done by University of Minnesota has found a couple ideas on how to do that. One is reduce the amount of mowing. So if you can reduce the mowing to every two to three weeks, that's great because they're finding that you have bee diversity in even in some of these lawns because there's a lot of things which are surviving which we don't tend to notice. And also raise your mower height, you know, at least four inches or greater. That leaves a lot more habitat. And include various things like here, uh, we've included Dutch sweet white clover, which are used by a lot of bees. Here is a brown belted bumblebee, a honeybee, and an alfalfa leaf cutter bee using uh, Dutch sweet white clover. Those dandelions which are growing in your yard in the spring, sometimes is maybe the only thing blooming to help those bees. <clears throat> Other things like creeping thyme, ground plums, but there are a variety of things. But even plantains we're finding, the exotic plantains, particularly the narrow leaf plantain, which produces this nice long stalk and a flower head. A lot of bees are using that and also beneficial flies, the hoverflies, use those a lot. And then number 10, educate your neighbors. Add a pollinator habitat sign and help to reconnect habitats. So uh, groups like Grow Native sell a number of signs. We actually have these in our yard. This is actually from our front yard now, uh, from earlier in the spring. You can see the prairie coreopsis, some um, uh, in bloom. There's even more stuff in bloom now. But we want to let people know that what we're doing, oftentimes, um, just by having a sign, it really gets people aware of, oh, this is intentional as opposed to, oh, you're just letting a bunch of weeds grow. Uh, even leaving leaves, we put up a sign, leave the leaves. So in one area, we did not clean up the leaves. So we want people to know that it provides also native habitat. 
educating your neighbors. And we're now seeing more and more people, at least in our neighborhood, putting in more native plants. Uh, they haven't started putting up the signs yet, but we think by having these signs, it's also a way to educate people on what they can do and what we're trying to do. And then by doing that, we wanna reconnect our neighbors and our communities. And we can do that through pollinator habitat. Now in this time of a pandemic and COVID-19, reconnecting can be a problem, but we can do it at a distance. So we can do social distancing with our pollinator garden. So if we can get all of our neighbors putting in these various pollinator gardens or various types of flowering plants, we can get those connections for those bees because many bees can't travel very far. Some of our smaller bees might only travel 100 yards, so they need to have those resources nearby. Some bees like bumblebees may travel one or even two miles, so they can travel a little bit farther. But reconnecting community and doing that through gardens so everybody becomes a pollinator conservationist can be really exciting. And ways that you can start doing this, look at also the habitat you might have around you. Try to expand that existing corridor that you might have. If you live next to a park or live next to, you know, growing up in the Chicago area, forest preserves or other natural habitats, look at what you can do to expand that into your yard. Or look at your community, maybe get your know, community involved and look at what existing trees you have right now and how can you put in additional trees which will support both pollinators and also those native caterpillars which are also gonna support our native birds too. Look at your property as a bridge, stepping stone between other types of habitats or connecting as a corridor, filling up that space which might be there or buffering to just kind of expand that patch. And when we think about corridors, probably the largest corridor that we're thinking about lately is the Monarch Highway, which is the I-35 corridor from Texas all the way to Minnesota. And we're trying to work on that right now, the St. Louis Zoo, the I-35 corridor here in Missouri. But think of every habitat, every garden, every yard, every community as part of whether it be the Monarch Highway or a Bumblebee Highway as they've done in the city of Oslo and Norway. All of these create pollinator corridors and connections. And the final thing I want to mention is this one, which kind of um, concerns some people, like we're prom oh, promoting bee gardens. Well, we, a lot of people get overly concerned about you know, getting stung. You know, we've got a lot of bees in our garden. We have no issues. When a bee is on a flower, all they care about is pollen and nectar. All they think about is eating and drinking. Just like when you're at dinner or at lunch, all you're thinking about is eating and drinking. You're not thinking about hitting anybody. Same with, well, hopefully not thinking about hitting anybody. Same with the, the bees. They could care less about you. Additionally, if you go into a crowded mall around Christmas time, and hopefully we can do that again, if you like doing that sort of thing, uh, you start swinging your arms, somebody's going to hit you. You walk around amongst a bunch of bees and start swinging your arms, somebody's going to hit you too. So just act like you would with other people. Enjoy the flowers. As I said, I'm in the garden all the time looking at these bees, photographing them, and they could really care less about me. Now, there are a number of good resources besides this, you know, uh, webinar, which is going to be posted, but Xerxes Society has a lot of good resources which you can download to find information on plants and also citizen science projects like Bumblebee Watch you can get involved with in order to support pollinators in your yard. There are a number of good books out there. Attracting Native Pollinators came out several years ago. It's one, it was actually one of the first books that really went through the various genera of bees, the different types of bees. It also goes through butterflies too, and how to create everything from a small patch to a larger patch. 100 Plants to Feed the Bees. This goes through trees, shrub, trees, shrubs, and also exotic fruit trees and ornamentals to give you a broad range of plants that um, really help to create a healthy pollinator habitat. If you go online, go to Pollinator Partnership, and, which is pollinator.org, you can put in your zip code and you, it will recommend a particular planting guide for your zip code. Uh, so like for example, here in St. Louis, depending on the uh, zip code you put in, you're gonna get most likely prairie parkland or eastern broadleaf forest. It will give you a list of trees, shrubs, and wildflowers, all natives, that you can use to attract a variety of native pollinators. A couple of additional books if you want to get into start identifying. There's The Bumblebees of North America by Paul Williams uh, et al. Bees in Your Backyard, which covers all the different types of bees. Um, this one is kind of a mix of both very 
user-friendly uh, layperson identifying bees, but then it also gets into, if you really wanna go hardcore and look at bees under a microscope, there's some information there. These two books by Heather Holmes, Bees, Identification Native Plant Foraging Guide, and Pollinators of Native Plants are really good to give you an idea of what to plant and what those bees are to attract them and by season. Some of her stuff is a little limited because she's from Minnesota. Most of it will cover the entire Midwest, um, but these are really excellent, readily available resources to really help you, you know, find those items. And I've put here on the last slide um, my email address. I'm very happy to take questions both today, now, but then also uh, later on, if you've got some questions for me, feel free to email me at the zoo at spivak at stlzoo.org. And I wanna thank you for joining me uh, to let me tell you about something really exciting, you know, about bees like this two-spotted bumblebee and prairie purple, uh, purple prairie clover. You know, when you start getting the bees in your backyard, you start seeing this excitement, you start seeing this activity, you really start seeing life again. And as I say, by doing this, you can be a pollinator conservationist right at home. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Ed, that was great. I love when you reinforce that I can plant things in my yard that are low maintenance that I won't <laughs> necessarily kill and that I can leave things for winter. Those right. are all great news. <laughs> so um, we have about 10 minutes and we have six or seven questions. So um, okay. they're all great questions. So um, we'll jump right in here. Um, the first one is um, about bee hotels. So right. is it too late this year to put up a bee hotel? And where would you put a bee hotel where it would be the most helpful? Right, so it's not too late. Um, right now, the bees which are active in, the bee, in our bee hotels are the alfalfa leaf cutter bees. Uh, we've already had um, the larger mason bees like Osmia lignaria and actually an exotic Osmia cornifrons. Uh, but there are leaf cutter bees throughout the season. So you can still put them up now. The biggest concern is many of the ones that are available online or when you go to stores, I feel are too short. Bees determine the sex of their offspring, whether the egg is fertilized or not. So if the egg is fertilized, it's a female. If it is not fertilized, it's a male. So these twig and tunnel nesting bees determine which egg is gonna be male and female. In the back of the nest, in the farthest part, it's usually females. In the front, they're males. So that if there's a woodpecker or a parasitoid wasp or something going through, males are a little more expendable. But what you really wanna think about is the depth. So general rules of thumb, if the hole in the nest or one that you're making is less than a quarter inch in diameter, it should be three to four inches deep. If it's a quarter inch or larger, it should be five to six inches deep. And many of the nests that you can buy are really about three inches and the holes are fairly large. They will still function, but I don't think they'll function as well as if you start making your own by drilling your own holes and making your own sculpture, having fun with it. Placement, you want to place it facing east to south so they get morning to afternoon sun. Um, think about where our weather comes from. Our weather tends to come from the west and the north. So you really don't want the weather coming in the front door of those bees. So you like to kind of protect them and place them near the gardens too, but also place them where you can watch things going on. So different bees are coming in and out. So whether it's you, your kids, your grandparents, your neighbors, everybody start watching those bees. Well, it's really cool with, I have a few now, I think I'm addicted to bee hotels. We put up a new one every year in addition. Um, and it's really cool to just, they all show up one day depending on the species. It's right, like, and the big thing now is really kind of spread them out through your garden uh, so you don't confine them in one space. So that uh, reduces the issues with disease and uh, predator issues and parasitoids. So spread them throughout the gardens. Very cool. All right, um, here's a good question. What do squash bees feed on when squash aren't blooming? That's a very good question. So there are, so what's, so the pollen itself is really what the offspring need. So they are oligolectic in that the young need that pollen. So they're not going to be producing any new young without that pollen. Now the adults, if need be, can find a few other nectar sources, uh, but they often tend to be limited. It is a really good example. If you go to the Grow Native website or if you email me, I can uh, send you, we put together a really nice companion planting guide for vegetables and fruits. 
So if you're growing tomatoes or squashes, these are some wildflowers you should plant in order to give them a little bit more nectar in order to feed them. So, but they really require that pollen in order to, you know, raise their young. So if you don't have squashes, you're not gonna have squash bees, you're not gonna have baby squash bees. <laughs> oh, okay, I feel you here. Kay cannot break the butterfly bush habit and she still has one in her garden. Um, it's such a consistent nectar flower throughout the entire gardening year. Is it okay to keep the one? Um, if you control it, um, because they can be invasive. Uh, as an example, I go bike riding here in Linwood Park and there's the uh, bike path along River to Pear. And I noticed the other day, there's a butterfly bush along the River to Pear along with all the thistles. It can be a horribly you know, invasive. Um, what I'd recommend is to cut it back in the fall so it can't spread as readily and you don't have seeds produced. I usually find that you know people may be addicted to it, um, Bees and butterflies, not so much. Um, I don't tend to see a lot of diversity of bees utilizing them. I'll see honeybees and large carpenter bees, not too much else. Um, I will see more butterflies, monarchs, tiger swallowtails, those sorts of things. Uh, but just control it. <laughs> it's just really, you know, I don't want to be, I'd love to be a purist, but there are things that we just kind of like. It's a, it makes a statement. Um, but just kind of, you know, make sure it doesn't get out of hand. <laughs> All right. Um, so Allie's wondering, are there good pollinator plants for container gardens? Uh, yeah, actually, there are a lot of them. We actually, oh, you could have answered too. My wife suddenly handed me a note. Because <laughs> these are ones we actually have in our containers right now. Uh, Rattlesnake Master, it's doing beautifully. Monarda, Bee Balm, Plains Coreopsis, Wild Strawberries, uh, if you've got uh, more of a wet container, irises and cardinal flowers. Um, if something's a little hotter, we've got agave and flame flower. So we have actually those in our containers right here now. Um, and also I think Missouri Wildflower Nursery, if you go to their website, Merv Wallace has done a lot of work in container guards, so he may have some more suggestions too. Nice, thanks for the help, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have one more bee-related one. Do bee yep. nests attract woodpeckers? Um, they will attract wood. Uh, so the, the solid block ones, um, and depending on where they're placed, these bees, the, the woodpeckers may come to them because it's a meal for them. So they'll drill a hole and then use their long time to pick it out. There are ways to, to deal with that. One is at the end of the season, remove that block, store it somewhere else. You can also put a mesh over the front of it where they can't really get to it. The bee hotels, which are done with the reeds and uh, bamboo and stuff, woodpeckers don't seem to deal with those because they don't get perching like a block of wood. So there are ways of protecting. We put up some uh, bee hotels on a, a reservation up in uh, Winnebago in Nebraska, and we have a little grate over it to make sure that we don't have woodpeckers bothering those holes. All right, one more question. Sure. Where's your picture from? Which from one? You. The one behind oh, oh, the you. One, this one here? Yeah. So the background is the National Bison Range in Montana. So we're working with the Confederate Sage and Kootenai Tribes, of, uh, the Flathead Nation in Montana, and the National Bison Range is on there too. Uh, we're working with several tribes across the country, and this is just a, a beautiful site with bison. Yeah, Brittany um, asked, and she was correct. She asked specifically if it was Montana. So yes. <laughs> it's that big sky behind you. Yep. All right, well, Montana, the Flathead Nation. <laughs> we are just about out of time, um, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew that both of the webinars from this week will be available on our website um, underneath the virtual learning section. So you can either find it under the education tab or if you just scroll down to that part where it says stay connected with the zoo, we'll have them up either this Monday or next Monday. It just kind of depends on what else we're putting up, but we always put up our content on Mondays. So um, if you do also have any other questions for Ed before that, um, he does have his website or his email address up right, right I don't there. have a website. You don't have a website. I better look at my Facebook. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Ed. This was wonderful. I'm going to have to go hang out in my garden now and enjoy it. Yeah, I'm going to go back and try and find this one particular type of bee, which has been trying to get, I'm getting pictures of.
Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Happy Pollinator Week. Thank you. Bye.